A very good evening to you, and uh, you welcome once again to another edition of the Business Advocates on Ghana Television. This is the, the last edition in the month of March. Uh, um, that's the end of the first quarter of the year 2016. Tonight we're discussing how far Ghana has gone with ratification of the trade facilitation agreements. Um, it is an essential um, discussion that we have to discuss this passionately this evening. And uh, in December 2013, the members of the World Trade Organization WTO concluded negotiations on the trade facilitation agreement on the Indonesian island and province of Bali. The agreement at the Bali Ministerial Conference came as part of a wider Bali package. Since then, WTO members have undertaken a legal review of the text. In line with the decision adopted in Bali, WTO members adopted on the 27th of November 2014 a protocol of agreement to insert the new agreement into Annex 1A of the WTO agreement in general. The trade facilitation agreement uh, will be in force once two-thirds of WTO's 162 members have completed their domestic ratification processes. To date, out of 65 WTO members that had ratified, only seven of them, we are told, excluding Ghana, were from Africa out of a total of 40 African WTO members. Essentially, the WTO is a place where member governments try to sort out the trade problems they face with each other. The trade facilitation agreement contains provisions for expediting the movement, release, and clearance of goods, including goods in transit. It also sets out measures for effective cooperation between customs and other appropriate authorities on trade facilitation and customs of compliance issues. It further contains uh, provisions for technical assistance and capacity building in this area. Tonight, business advocates will examine why Ghana has not ratified the agreement and assess how far it has gone with procedures required of domestic ratification process of the TFA vis-a-vis -vis any bottlenecks hindering the process. Business advocate is powered by the Bruce of with support from the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and the Ghana Journalists Association. Good evening once again. Let me announce our text lines for you, 0261783382. Number again is 0261783382. And now time for me to introduce my august guests for tonight's edition, which promises to be very insightful. The only lady amongst us tonight, I'm glad to introduce to you tonight, Ms. Valentina Minta, Chief Executive of West Blue Operators of National Single Window at the Port. Good evening, Valentina. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. I also have Mr. Emmanuel Johnny Kwame, Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce Ghana, also MD of the World Trade Center Accra. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Ahead of me, I have uh, Mr. Joseph Agbaka, immediate past president of the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders and a member of the National Trade Facilitation Committee. Sir, you're welcome. Thank you. Great. So, um, having gone through the introduction, let me start this way. Now, the International Chamber of Commerce Ghana, ICCG, has formed a coalition, national coalition, I should say, which engaged in advocacy to ratify the trade facilitation agreement, TFA. Now, for the benefit of the US tonight, can you briefly tell us um, the makeup of the ICCG, um, uh, Mr. Don Kwan? Yeah, the, in 1919, mm -hmm. reeling from the devastation of the First World War, mm -hmm. um, a group of entrepreneurs thought it wise that there is the need for an association that will represent the views of business everywhere in the world. Okay. And then with the setting up of the International Chamber of Commerce in 1923, mm -hmm. they also saw the need to create an international court of arbitration. Okay. And I guess um, the court has been in the news these days as a result of the Waterville case yes. and yes. then that of uh, CP. Mm. But along the line, they realized that their central rule 
has been to provide some form of policy direction for our various governments, that there is a role for the private sector to play. And our focus is on international trade. Mm -hmm. So ICC works through a network of national committees in every country. Mm -hmm. So in Ghana, ICC operates through ICC Ghana, okay. which is a group of experts who have the expertise in international trade and those who have the expertise in trade finance. Okay. And then we also provide our lawyers who sit on our court of arbitration and also provide training for, for arbitrators. I see. The TFC mm. is something that they've been working on mm. since its creation. Mm. And in 2003, the ICC thought it wise that to facilitate trade mm. in developing countries, uh, it's very much more important to establish a network of uh, businesses or business associations mm. that can push their individual government to see to it that an agreement is isolated from the various WTO agreements that will only solely look at uh, trade facilitation, okay. which more or less has to do with the simplification and the harmonization of procedures that will enable businessmen to move goods uh, from one country to the other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, can you tell us the composition of the coalition, who and who are members of the coalition? ICC Ghana more or less engaged all the business associations okay. in Ghana. Okay. And that includes AGI, the Association of Ghana Industries. Mm -hmm. We have the Ghana Employers Association. Okay. We have the Federation of Association of Ghanaian Exporters. Mm -hmm. We have the Ghanaian Union Traders Association, that's okay. Guta. Mm -hmm. We also have the Ghana Shippers uh, Authority. Authority, and then Ship Owners uh, Association of Ghana. So many of them, including mm. World Trade Center Accra. Okay, as well as the Private Enterprise uh, yeah. Federation. Yeah, well, most, mm. most of them are members of PEF. So, yeah. Okay, of, of course, of course, yeah. of course. I see. So um, briefly, um, any of you could come in here also. In a nutshell, what does a TFA entail, the Trade Practitioner Agreement? What, what is it? And, and we, we, we want to be uh, moved away from technical definitions and explanations as much as possible so that our stakeholders down there would understand exactly what it is so they can move along with us. So what does it entail, the TFA? The issues that are culminated in the drafting of the agreement mm. has to do with issues that confront us on a daily basis. Okay. And it is being observed at most ICC meetings that these are prevalent in development, uh, developing countries, especially ours. And these has to do with the uncertainties uh, that we all encounter mm. when we're moving goods across borders, the delays. And then these also affect our predictability and they tend to add on to transaction cost at our ports or transaction cost even moving goods across borders. And unfortunately, we are the people who live in countries where the cost of living it's, 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 it's high. high yeah. And then we also don't have the means mm. you know, to pay for most of the things we bring in. So there is the need to have an agreement that will help improve standards. That will also help build the capacities of, uh, of our institutions mm. and our structures that will facilitate trade. Mm -hmm. So basically, trade facilitation agreement is simply the simplification and harmonization of just the procedures and documentation at the, mm -hmm. at the port, mm -hmm. at which it's, it's happening in most countries now, mm -hmm. basically through automation, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then also coming out with rules and aligning the, the various agencies at the port so that at least things are more simple and then more transparent. Mm -hmm. because. Um, any investor that's coming into a country will be looking at the cost that they intend to pay for as far as the cost that happens within the various supply chains. Mm. So a TFE, it's for everybody, not okay. just importers or exporters, mm. it's for every single mm. business entity mm. in mm. the country. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Because eventually the cost will, 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 will trickle we'll probably, down yeah. to everybody. Now, uh, uh, Valentin, I want to add a bit on that, um, especially, uh, you know, why Ghana must ratify uh, the agreement. Okay.
Thank you, Hani. So as Mr. Donny Kwame said, trade facilitation is all about faster, simpler um, ways of accessing international trade. But if you look at it in its entirety, you have a lot of processes happening before the border, mm -hmm. at the border, and after the border. So we have to ensure that we look at all those processes. We also have to look beyond processes and look at our infrastructure. What are our road networks like? What are our corridors like? So that we can have a holistic national approach That's of right. having a competitive international trade environment. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the trade facilitation agreement, which came into force December 2013, as you mentioned earlier, once you have two thirds of the members of the WTO ratifying, it becomes it, it, it comes into full force. Yeah. That means there are going to be implications. There are going to be sanctions for those countries who do not, not. comply to that particular agreement. Yes. At the moment, you mentioned that there were about 60. Uh, at, at the last count of okay. yesterday, there were about 80 something countries. Really that so 81. They keep increasing. It yeah. keeps increasing. That's encouraging then. It and is we a, still have not. Yeah, but we're okay. well. We're getting there. All right. So I'm listening so, to you. <laughs> yeah. So with 80, and we need 108. Two thirds okay. of that exactly. number is 108. Eight. We're at 81. It jumped from 71 to 81 in, in less than a week. Wow. So there is movement. Now there's another component beyond rat. So once you have two thirds ratifying, everybody automatically becomes accountable for that agreement. But beyond that, there are three categories that the TFA. Um, lays out. There's category A, and for all those processes or for those activities, once the ratification is complete, you should have implemented those elements within category A. So every country must, or well, the um, developing countries and least developing countries mm -hmm. must present their category A activities or items mm -hmm. which are expected to be implemented by ratification. Then there's category B, which allows a transitional period for which those will be implemented. Mm -hmm. Then there's category C, which is a period after the transitional period for implementation. So whereas trade facilitation should be at the heart and at the core of every country, it is imperative if you want to be competitive and if you want to improve your economic growth. Mm -hmm. So that goes without saying. But now we have a global agreement that mm -hmm. sets the, the standards, sets the timelines, mm -hmm. with sanctions if countries do not uh, adhere to that. Mm -hmm. So we have two, two, um, two calls to action mm -hmm. for our own national um, position on the global stage and yeah. for our uh, agreement mm. uh, responsi mm. responsibilities. Mm. Now, if you look at the trade facilitation agreement, I think the WTO got it right in that there's provision for, there's, there's something called the special, um, the, uh, the SDTs, that's the special differential treatment, which gives special provision to developing countries and least developing countries. So it gives them the flexibility to be able to compete on the same stage as those developed and mature um, or, um, countries. Therefore, it is good for us to be able to um, take advantage of that. And if we don't do anything and we stay still, all countries will go past us in terms of um, competitiveness and attractiveness of their ports. Um, currently, if we look at our peers in the sub-region, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, um, Senegal, um, have already ratified. Mm -hmm. And there are 70 plus Senegal, Senegal Cote d'Ivoire, and Nigeria, amongst yeah. others. Yeah. I'm just looking at our, exactly. our immediate neighbors. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So that is ratification. Mm -hmm. And ratification is where you need two thirds of members um, to right. do that. But if you look at category A provision, over 70 um, least developed countries and developing countries have submitted their category A um, activities. Mm -hmm. So we, we're, Ghana is in the process of doing that, and we hope to be a part of the 108, but at the very <laughs> least, a part of the 70 plus, who must, you must, we, uh, as, uh, as a nation, we must submit our category A activities. We have no choice. For category A, there's no choice. Mm -hmm. Ratification, once two thirds do it, then everybody automatically have to move along with it. OK. Uh, Mr. Um, Agbaga, can you break down to our viewers and all stakeholders, what, what's in category A? 
where I believe Ghana and Ghana. Yeah, you know. currently uh, at the end of uh, our 2014 assessment needs, mm -hmm. uh, Ghana came up under category A measures as six areas. That is under the Article 6.3, which talks about uh, penalty principle disciplines, and Article 9 talks about movement of goods under customs control. Uh, Article 10.7 talks about common border procedures and requirements and uniform document documentation relating to clearance. Then. Uh, Article 10.8 also talk about uh, rejected goods. Article 10.9 talks about temporarily admission of goods inward and outward processing. And then Article 13.2 talks about um, National Committee on Trade Facilitation. And these are the areas that uh, we feel that there are things that we are already doing and therefore we are compliant as a country as a yeah, country right. so what it means is that if today the 108 countries uh, ratification takes effect mm -hmm. we do these are areas that we are already compliant so we don't have any any uh, reason not to be able to continue doing that mm -hmm. so this is our category A, that is in a draft form, which uh, by my uh, investigation as at yesterday uh, has been put into a cabinet memo, which is before the trade minister for him to push for, uh, for parliament. Mm -hmm. As at yesterday morning. In fact, once we mentioned the trade minister, let me let uh, viewers know that we're expecting a rep from the trade ministry, but whoever was assigned um, has to attend to an equally uh, urgent program, and so he couldn't make it. But the program is still going on. But he did say only yesterday, Mr. Albaga. Yeah, yesterday morning. The person who is supposed to be with us that I spoke with. Mm -hmm. Is the same person who's supposed to be here yeah. with us. Is the same person who have another uh, equally mm. important engagement mm. at the Kwame Kuma mm. University mm. of Ghana in Kumasi. Mm. So he I could see. not okay. be with us. Mm. Mm. But why has it taken us this long, uh, Kwame? Uh, be uh, okay, before we go on, okay. I want I want us to uh, I want to state some of the salient points or the summary of the TFE. One mm -hmm. is about transparency. Mm -hmm. Two, about public comments before anything, any uh, public comment, meaning that member states to have an opportunity for traders mm -hmm. and the interested parties yes. to comment on any of the rules as far as uh, international trade uh, is concerned. When any law or any rule is coming out, there must be that opportunity for them to comment, to okay. give their view. Okay, to make inputs, if you to like. To make inputs right. mm. uh, to what will come. Okay. And then there is also about advanced classification and country of origin ruling, mm. which means that uh, before even importation are made into Ghana, uh, the importer should be able to do what? To go to customs and, and tell customs with, uh, that these are the goods that I wanted to bring into Ghana. These are the documents. Mm -hmm. I want you to give me the valuation and everything before even the goods are, right. are, are oh, even sure. consigned okay. to. So that is also one part of it. And then transparency in inspection, detention, and audit is also part of the uh, of, the tra uh, of the trade facilitation agreement. Okay. And also, it talks also about authorized operators, which means that members are committed to providing additional trade facilitation measures such as low documentary and data requirements for low rates of inspection and rapid 
release time. This uh, authorized operators, me, meaning that they are compliant with their records in-house. Mm. They are the people that the state should give them the opportunity that by the time that the, the, their goods reach our ports, they should even be allowed to carry it to their premises and other things could be could be uh, other control mm. could be could be affected even even in their premises. Okay, that is the scope of uh, the authorized uh, operators. Mm. And then it talks also about disciplines on fees and charges. Fees that are connected with importation and exportation. Uh, more often, we exert fees but we we did not we, we we don't question the basis of the fees mm. does it commensurate with the work that is being done Absolutely. or otherwise Critical question. these are part of the uh, of the of the salient point and also discipline on penalty actions let's say um, you are in a process of any trade any trade documentation and if there is any breach under the law customs has between 100 to 300 uh, percent penalty that they must levy on you but it is only said but what goes into it and the rationale behind uh, the TFA is now bringing it to bear that we must allow those who are going to pay this money understand why they are paying this money. That's right. That's it's, right. Also, it, it's also becoming a strict rule. Okay. And also about freedom of transit. Okay. So, so we, would, we would have time to go into details. But, um, <clears throat> Mr. Doni Kwame, let's look at practical the, the, the benefits that will be accrued from all these. Um, to the uh, stakeholders, importers, exporters, and everybody. And from there, I'll let um, Valentina come and tell us more on that. Benefits. Okay. Let people understand yeah, why. To, to, to address your earlier right. question, exactly. there was the total lack of awareness. Mm. And uh, if you look at the membership of the coalition, mm. these are different interest groups. Yes. You have importers in there, you have exporters. Uh, you have uh, freight forwarders. I forgot to add the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders oh, are also okay. members of the, the coalition. coalition. But we all realize that one way or the other, we're all involved in international trade, even as consumers. Mm -hmm. And the TFA provides for fast track services for those who are compliant, especially low risk taxpayers, so that customs can focus on those that they think they have a problem with. If the person is tax compliant over the period mm. and keeps on clearing goods at the port, pays his taxes regularly, then you should not scrutinize or um, scrutinize or provide delays mm. or mm. all the bureaucracy that we mm. see at the ports. Mm. The aggressive and, yeah, and there's also the need for customs to work closely with the private sector. Mm. We are supposed to share information. Yes. There's the need for that kind of trust. Okay. And uh, the bottom line is. Once all these things are implemented, we believe it will reduce both the cost and the time in doing business. Mm. You know, the cost, as far as transaction cost is concerned, and then the time. Mm. Once there's automation, you know things will be faster. You don't let it go through a system and also do physical uh, inspection. Mm. There should be that trust. And uh, these are laws but that... But isn't, isn't part of the operations that are port already automated? Yeah, but th these are laws that are binding on all. It's, it's a standard that's supposed to apply to every country okay. at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we've also realized that some are developed. You go to the port of Rotterdam, it, everything is automated. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you hardly see the human factor mm -hmm. in there that much. Mm -hmm. So the, as Madam mentioned, there are yeah. categories, the yes. A, B, and C. C. The C may need some investment. Okay. So you need to upgrade you your to equipment. To up to that level. Yeah. Where and then train your staff so okay. that our ports can also operate efficiently, just okay. like those. Okay. 
Okay. Us, yeah. okay. Okay. Well, let's now let's look more at the positives, the benefits. Yes. yes. Okay. So the benefits, uh, there are benefits for all um, levels That's of right. the society. Mm -hmm. If we look at import, export, and transit, mm -hmm. that is the scope of what yes. we're looking at. That's right. You really need a joint up approach to achieve the vision, mm -hmm. to be able to realize the benefits which we'll be discussing. That's right. Now, if you look at the stakeholders or the actors within import, export, and transit, mm -hmm. you can see that there's business to business um, relationships. That's the buyer and the seller. Then you have business to government. Mm -hmm. So that's the buyer or the seller with government regulatory agencies. And then you have government to government, government. which is really key. So we keep talking about customs. If you look at the trade facilitation agreement, majority of the activities lie within the customs arena. But mm -hmm. customs cannot operate in, si in isolation of the partner government agencies. So in looking at compliance, yes, we'll look at the tax compliance of traders. You also look at their safety compliance with Ghana Standards Authority, for example, their health compliance with food and drug. So we have to look at it from a national point of view. So you have the B2B, the B2G, then you have the G2G, which is really key. And it's that government to government, you need efficiencies across all those levels. And then I would add another one which just came up, which would be country to country. Because for international trade, by virtue of it being international, you have to partner with your counterpart countries. Yes, yes, yes. So as you can see, if we can all come together to achieve what the trade facilitation agreement is advocating, then there is a benefit for government, for private sector, because now they'll have predictable processes, transparent processes, particularly for our export mm. development. Mm. Um, in 2015, WTO, trade, uh, um, WTO came up with a, a trade report that over the period of the trade facilitation agreement, that if we stick, if countries stick to the implementation, there is a possibility of um, growing our export by 2.7%. Now, this has a lot of gains for particularly yeah, developing yes. and least developing countries mm. who tend to have that imbalance of trade, heavily relying on imports as opposed to exports, but having the, cap the capacity to improve that export base. Mm. So you can see that there is that benefit to um, private sector or businesses, particularly our export um, area, which is underdeveloped. And then for government, there is certainly revenue, um, if efficiency of revenue collection, mm -hmm. delivery of optimum, optimum services to their clients who is the private sector. And then the man on the streets, the citizen, if you're able to get um, afford a rightly priced goods to market, and save goods to market, either import or export, that helps them acquire these goods at competitive prices in a timely manner, in a safe way. And for our exports, we can ensure that our ex exporters remain competitive because they would be competing with other exporting countries for the same goods and services. So as a nation, we need to provide them that environment so they can be quick to market, to compete with their counterparts out there. So in terms of qualitative benefits, yeah. there is that national competitiveness which okay. we will achieve. Mm. We will certainly attract more foreign direct investment, mm. which will, and collectively we will boost our economic growth. Mm. Quantitatively, I mentioned earlier, there's yes. the pos potential of 2.7 2 2 annually yeah, that's right. for our export. Also in 2012, World Economic Forum came up with a, um, a research statistics mentioning that if we look at efficiencies within our supply chain processes, you're likely to increase efficiency by more than GDP, mm -hmm. by s more than six times by just looking at the tariff barriers. Therefore, there's a lot to be gained by looking at our processes, mm -hmm. simplifying those, and improving it. So benefits, huge benefits. If we don't do anything, we'll be left behind and all countries will move yes, forward. Yes. But it is now an imperative, not a choice. Yes. And uh, the good news is there's a lot of work going on on the ground. Um, there's a governance structure for the project that are working on that brings together technical committee members from private and um, government, including the 
Chamber of Commerce. There are working groups that are, are working on that. There are quite a number of initiatives on the country going on. But we need to have that joint up approach so that we can realize the vision in a timely mm. manner. Mm. And then um, present our categories and our ratifications whilst the work goes on in the field. Mm. So we need to have that. And in terms of by virtue of it being a national project, yes. you need to have political will and you need to have leadership so that mm. we can all drive that. The foot soldiers can do their work and the leaders can do that. And um, I can say that we do have that in the projects that we're working in. And in, in, in the, the National Single Window Project, for example, the governance structure is made up of a steering committee okay. of foreign ministries. Um, chaired by the chief of staff mm. and then you have a technical committee made up of 20 participants from both private sector and the um, government sector and then you have the working group members so we are at a position where we we're having our ducks lined up nice, nicely yeah. we now just have to make sure that we leverage on all the um, activities that are going on in different pockets mm. have a national approach um, tap into the trade facilitation agreement requirements in terms of category A as a priority, ratification, and then category B and C. And I think we will be able to move this nation forward. Mm. Do, do we have any sense of agency in this, Mr. Dona Um we, we have no choice. Mm. And uh, as far as this uh, advocacy action is concerned, mm. our target is to see to it that at least we present a list a uh, schedule of uh, commitments mm -hmm. for category A mm -hmm. latest by July. Late by July. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the target. Yeah. And how, we, how close are we to the target? Oh, well, listening to my colleague mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> from the Ghana Institute of Trade Forwardness, it's, 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 it's good to hear that at least uh, there's a document that's being sent to cabinet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, now <coughs> what, what really pushed you to embark on this advocacy action? As I mentioned earlier, mm. since 2003. Okay, so that, that was the background. That was the background. Right? Okay. ICCs okay. around the world okay. to okay. get up on it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Now, have you engaged parliaments in all these? Because they, they are the lawmakers, obviously, they have to be engaged. Uh, they, there was the general lack of awareness. So, as a result of the action, we had a stakeholders workshop meeting at the World Trade Center, mm. and we invited the Parliamentary Select Committee mm. on Trade. And okay. tourism mm. and uh, the leadership were present. Okay. So everybody had the opportunity to go through the agreement and then uh, at least to, to be informed of, of the necessity or the agency mm. for us to push and then get a uh, list ready. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, have you encountered some challenges so far? Uh, Obviously, yes. But uh, for, uh, for now, what, what I would say is that. There was the general lack of awareness. Mm, okay. So once we had a sensitization workshop, mm. both uh, on the private sector side, that's for members of the coalition, and mm. then the main actors, mm. uh, that includes uh, the Ministry of Trade, uh, officials from customs, okay. and then uh, uh, MPs from, from, from parliament mm. who were present at the workshop. And we all took time, time to go through the agreement. Mm. You know. Now, now in, in Valentina's uh, submission, she talking about the export and all that. Do we have anything to, to if you like, uh, protect perishable goods along the line? Because if you're going to export and, and, and duly perishable goods, do we have any, 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 they anything all, to do with them? They all captured in the agreement. Okay. Uh, there are articles that uh, are supposed to take care of mm. issues relating to exports and mm. issues relating to imports. And under exports, um, I believe the National Facilitation Committee mm. took note of that. Mm. And then based on the infrastructure we have available, mm. if it's not adequate enough, uh, definitely such issues will be pushed under Category C, that Ghana needs support. Uh, to build the necessary infrastructure mm. to be able to deal with issues that has to do with perishable goods, mm. whether they are in transit mm. or they are meant for export mm. or they be coming into the country as imports. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Now, what has been the, the level of collaboration with your duty bearers, uh, especially the Ministry of Trade Industry, which is not here? Uh, what has been the, uh, you know, the involvement level? 
I encouraging? Was, yeah, it's quite encouraging. Quite because encouraging. It was, yeah, it was a wake up call. You sure quite encouraging? Yeah, it was a wake up call. You sure about that? Yeah, because they've done some work um, as far back as uh, two years ago. That's uh, 20. Uh, 2013 20, uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, and 2014, there was um, a temp, um, um, what do you call it, an interim national facilitation committee that mm. came up with the list, mm. which they were keen on sending to to WTU okay. as our, our category A. Mm. But along the line, they realized that most of the things have been implemented because mm. previously we had we had uh, this destination inspection Fashion companies. Yes. Now we have single window. Mm. In the in the old list we had it as a category A, but they had to take it out. Mm. You know, so it was a wake up call and at a workshop mm. with members of parliament present asking questions, mm. officials from the ministry mm. and then officials from customs. They all went through it mm. and then we uh, aligned some of the the, the positions. And uh, we had to move some articles from category A to category B mm. uh, for the National Facilitation Committee to, mm. to have a proper look at. Mm. Yeah. Mr. Abad, in the, in the structure, has the Ministry of Finance got any role to play? Uh, the Trade Facilitation Agreement itself is, uh, <clears throat> is a customs issue. Mm -hmm. However, uh, all over the world, is the trade ministry okay. who sits in the chair and uh, direct affairs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's about Ministry of Trade, mm -hmm. but the provisions contained in the uh, custom matters, mm -hmm. which custom. But GRI comes in. Yes. And GRI is under Ministry of Finance, finance yes, right? So yes, yes. So that is how the Ministry of Finance mm -hmm. comes, uh, in. comes in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a, a bit more, uh, Valentina, what, what does the uh, you know, National Single Window project do? What role does it play critically, practically, for us to understand and all the points? It's, uh, it's, 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 it's a crucial part of the whole uh, project. What, what role do you play briefly? So in terms of the National Single Window, the main objective is to reduce the time and cost of doing business right. across, across uh, import, export and transit mm -hmm. processes. Um, the way to achieve that is by looking at all dimensions of the trade supply chain. Mm -hmm. So by looking at the people, who are the users of the system, who are the operators of the system, what are the requirements to be able to facilitate trade, what are the capa capacity building needs, what are the training needs. So That's that right. we have to look at. Okay. And at the moment, we're conducting the needs and gap analysis, which is going to identify all the gaps mm -hmm. and make recommendations on how we uh, eliminate those gaps. So that's the first element. The next is about processes. You can only facilitate trade by understanding current processes, the reason why they exist, who has the mandate to, um, to conduct those processes, and to find out if there are any duplications, if there are any redundancies, uh, to ensure that we can harmonize and simplify those. Once we're able to do that, we can then look at automation. You cannot throw IT at your problems if you don't know what your problem is, because if not, you just make the same mistake faster and in a costlier mm -hmm. manner. So you need to understand the processes. So we're looking at all processes across import, export, and transit. You mentioned perishable goods, that's right. and that's really key, particularly mm -hmm. export. Yeah. So we need to look at those processes to ensure that we can create that conducive environment for our trade, our, our declarants, the trading public. Then we also now have to look at the ICT infrastructure, which is the platform mm -hmm. where the processes will sit and where the users and operators will inter uh, interoperate. Mm -hmm. So once we look at that, we need to be true to ourselves. What is the infrastructure we have in our country? Mm -hmm. What are the internet facilities? What are the energy, um, um, what's the energy situation? What measures do we have to put in place to ensure that we actually achieve automation of auto the real automation, automation, not just a tokenism. Yeah. So we're looking at that to identify those gaps so that we can put in measures that are fit for purpose for Ghana, mm -hmm. not something that would work further afield because they have certain things in place. Mm -hmm. So that is the third. And then looking at the policy, what okay. is the legal framework that would underpin all of those? 
we're just concluding that needs and gap analysis phase, which will now document the blueprint mm. for implementation. Now, it's really key that, as I mentioned, you can only be as strong as your weakest link. So it's extremely important that all actors and stakeholders buy into this blueprint mm -hmm. to say this is what is indeed going to move our country from where it is to where we want it to be, to be able to sustain it for generations to come. So that is what the national single window is about. It has a governance structure, as I mentioned earlier, the steering committee, technical committee, and the working group to make sure that whatever we're put in place outlives you and I and generations to come can um, build on, on, on that. So that's what the national single window is about, looking at putting in processes and systems that would ensure that we, we reduce the time and cost of doing international trade business mm -hmm. with our, with, uh, in Ghana with our trading partners. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kwame, um, we got a, a few minutes more to go. But let, let me ask you this critically. What do you make of the support from your, your partners, especially the Busak Fund? Um, Busak Fund came in at the right time. And uh, once we sold the idea to them, they realized the need and the agency. Because um, you have a situation whereby if it gets ratified without uh, Ghana sending in any list of notification mm -hmm. or Ghana actually ratify it. Once the two tests do ratify, it's binding on us. Mm. And then uh, we are compliant, we have to comply. And it, the, so the what danger, are the implications if we do not ratify, the, but then it becomes binding on us when the two tests go through? The, the danger is, is where you have a situation where an international business operator picks up the, the agreement mm -hmm. and he believes uh, as a trading partner of Ghana, yes. um, once we are all supposed to comply to these agreements, and uh, one component in there is that you are supposed to more or less publish mm -hmm. all your your cost as far as uh, international trade is concerned, mm -hmm. all your rules, you know. So once he has knowledge of of that, mm -hmm. and he transacts business and you fall foul, then you end up seeing the state, That's which the is the main uh, actor in mm -hmm. that department. Mm -hmm. So then you end the up with judgment. And it's likely you may be sued at the mm. ICC, International mm. Court of mm. Arbitration. Mm. Mm. So there's the need for, for us to, they saw it as a very urgent uh, project. Mm. And then they thought it wise that it goes beyond just one association. We should get every single private sector organization on board, mm. you know, to fast track this process. Okay. And so what we did was to meet with the various uh, business associations in Ghana. They all have their interest. Mm. Others thought it's something that's foreign, mm. uh, it's going to affect manufacturing, uh, importers, exporters thought it favors exporters. Because of lack of exporters knowledge. Exporters thought. Mm. But we all sat down and we realized that we all involved in international trade. Yes. And businessmen around the world are the same. We all want a good return on our investment. So we speak with one voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, ICC as the voice of uh, business. Otherwise, that this is not something for developed countries. Uh, it's something actually meant for least developed countries. Mm. Uh, so we have to simplify the whole issue okay. and then push our government to look at it, mm. you know, because there is a section within the agreement that allows for governments to come out with their own list okay. and then give themselves time, mm. because there is a category B where you state when you intend implementing the category B. Okay. Then there is a category C where you indicate that apart from the time, I also need support. Okay. And there are funds, uh, the WTO mm -hmm. has funds, and the various business bodies, that includes ICC, the World Economic Forum, they've also set up a coalition, okay. including some big multinationals, creating a fund for these developed countries, if you need that support, they will provide that support for you to build your infrastructure mm. to implement the trade facilitation agreement mm. for your business community. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Mr. Agbaga, you being the media past president of Ghana Free for Institute of Free Forward, is, uh, how do your members um, see this initiative, this project? Do they, they appreciate it? Yeah, this <coughs> trade facilitation agreement is mm. all about how to quicken the doing of business in our ports uh, to shorten the time mm. because the, the longer 
you stay on the job, the more, the more cost you incur. Cost you incur. Yeah. Even to the forwarder. Mm. Even to the forwarder. Because if it takes me uh, three days to complete a particular uh, transaction, and let's say by uh, the time that we start implementing the trade facilitation agreement, and it takes me four hours. Mm -hmm. See the difference. The difference is clear. Mm -hmm. So it is something that we are enthusiastic about. It is something that uh, not only the trade facilitation agreement that is bringing this out. Mm -hmm. When you go back to the uh, revised Kyoto Convention, RKC, mm -hmm. all these things are in there. In those days, uh, they only encourage us to do these things. It is they are old things that we, we have been encouraged to practice. But it is only that it has moved from that encouragement to a different uh, format that it is now becoming uh, a, 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 a law mm. that must bind on us mm. so that we can work efficiently mm -hmm. and save money mm -hmm. for for the betterment of every citizen in every country. Mm. Mr. Doni Kwame made a, a positive note not long ago that he's hopeful that by July this thing should have been where it has to be. You shared that? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, of course. Mm. Because my interaction with the Ministry of Trade mm. is more often than even he, uh, Doné Kwame mm. himself, because mm. I happen to be on the committee that work on the 2013 assessment needs okay. and then the 2014 assessment needs. Mm. So uh, I know exactly what I am saying. And before I was sitting, I am sitting here today. I have spoken to some the leader of that that committee, mm. an authority. Who's an yes. Authority. So. Uh, I took him by his word mm. that this has been put into a cabinet memo. We are also it's taking you by a word from his yes. word. So, yes. Yes. So we say that yes. You, I'm, you I'm, I'm confident about mm. that. Okay. Okay. So, so in July, what actually will be the position? What what actually will be will be done in July for us to know that indeed we, we've crossed over, if you like? Learning from what. Uh, neighbors have done, mm. you know. In the case of Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire, what they did was to come out with their uh, schedule of commitments okay. under Category A. Okay. And that's just a list of things you currently doing that you are compliant, mm. which is very simple, okay. you know. Mm. And I believe that can be done. Mm. Once that one is sent to the World Trade Organization, at least that's a first step, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From there, from from there, where, what next? Then we take the our time mm -hmm. to do a needs assessment mm -hmm. to come out with our category B, mm -hmm. those that we can do in the coming years, mm -hmm. and then the category C, those that we need support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. My time is run so fast now, but let me take final words from all of you. First of all, um, Valentina, we are all looking at July, okay, positively July. You share that also. Yes, mm. certainly. Mm. We can do it. And mm. we need to ensure that we align policy with execution. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing sending in your list and saying this is what we're going to do. We need to ensure that at the ex execution level, all our foot soldiers are ready to mm -hmm. ensure that we maintain our compliance and then we move into category B and C. So mm -hmm. very positive that we can do it together. Mm -hmm. So then, quickly, between now and July, what should we be doing to ensure that in July, July we send our, our, our list to the WTO between now and then? Work is Shortly. already being done, mm. so at least we'll continue with our advocacy. Mm. Actually, but we are in March. March yeah. is ending. Tomorrow is 1st April. Yeah. The, the biggest threat as we embarked on this journey mm. was the whole idea of it's an election yeah. year, so you didn't have a, a lot of the politicians. Interest. Mm. Yeah, the interest is not on mm. such agreements. In some countries, they will say, shelve it, mm. wait for whoever uh, yeah. is in power the following year, yeah. too, because it's an election yeah. year, you can't sign any agreement, you have to wait for the next mm. government. But we believe whoever comes, that's, that's a different agreement. That's right. Whether it's, uh, it has to be okay. done. Yeah, mm -hmm. it has to be done. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to go beyond July. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said that as your final words. So fa your final words, uh, Mr. Abaga. Yeah. Um, you go about 15 seconds for me. Yeah, my final word is uh, uh, 
how to continue uh, to have meetings with, uh, as far as the National Trade Facilitation Committee is concerned in order to iron out uh, some of the things that are earmarked for the category B and C, mm -hmm. which we have already uh, uh, been compliant with, especially when it comes to pre-arrival processing, mm -hmm. which the National uh, Single Window has already uh, implemented. So it, it has no place currently in category B as it is in the time that we came out with uh, these, uh, uh, the shadows. Okay. So these are some of the things. So what, what should be done about that? What should be done? Yeah. Uh, when, the, when we meet as a National Facilitation Committee, we will look at it and then move it to uh, to include it in our uh, category A uh, commitment. Mm, mm, mm. Looks like I, I missed time. I've, I've got a couple of more minutes to go, about mm. four minutes to go. But from, from what you said, wouldn't that also take uh, a little bit of time? No. no these okay. are recommendations mm -hmm. from our workshop. Okay. The okay. workshop that uh, we, a stakeholders workshop. So we had members of parliament in there. We had uh, officials from customs, mm. Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Trade. So it's the ministry that came out with the list of mm -hmm. what they've done so far. Mm. And then we had questions from uh, our, uh, MPs mm. and then the business associations. Mm. So as a result, since we had, we had all the actors in one place, those that are being implemented and those that have already been done were moved from various categories to the other, as he mentioned, mm. as at the time, they were coming out with this list. There was nothing like single window. Mm, mm. You know, we had GCNet and then the destination inspection companies. Mm. Now we have uh, a single window which is working. And then, so definitely we can't say we are not compliant when it mm. comes to that. Mm. So that one has to be moved from maybe category B or C to A. Mm. And that can be done. It's just redoing uh, your list, mm. moving uh, the articles from one position to the other. Mm. Mm. The most important thing is going around to make sure um, these are things that are already in place mm. and uh, you can defend it anywhere around the world mm. in case anybody comes and says you don't have a single window, we don't think it's working, mm. you know it's working and you can defend it anywhere. Mm. So that's your category A. Mm. Then you have the category B, the ones that you're not too sure of, mm. that you think you need time to test to be sure it's really working here. Yeah. Mm. Now, now, besides the risk of being dragged to the ICC, if you like, uh, in the events where, God for one, we have not ratified and uh, a partner takes us to court over an, an issue that forms part of the agreement, besides that risk, what, what else do we stand to lose uh, or to contend with? Should we if you like, you know, consider the daily dialing, you, you want to come in here? Yeah, but, I could. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot to lose. Okay. Um, we, we need to ensure that we ac Ghana accesses the global, uh, global supply chain. Ghana's exporters remain competitive on the global market. Mm -hmm. Our imports are efficient, that is relevant imports into a country are efficiently delivered and safely delivered into the country. Mm -hmm. So there's one thing about policy and agreements in place. As a nation, to remain competitive and to remain relevant, we need to ensure that we do have a, a facilitated trade a, a environment mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, economic growth that we're looking for. So it's a huge risk mm -hmm. if you look at the contribution of international trade to our GDP and, uh, and to the nations, uh, the, the economy of the nation. So we do stand a lot to lose even beyond the agreements, yeah. but by virtue of a, a competitive country, something has to be done. Mm -hmm. so, so the fine uh, projects that we need to be part of, we can't afford to, to, to miss out in all that. So, so I want you to synthesize uh, you know, those watching us this evening, uh, especially uh, the, the, the stakeholders on the ground, exporters, importers, and, and those in transit and all that, um, why they should be happy about this. Ghana over the years has played a very central role mm -hmm. as far as international trade is concerned. Mm -hmm. When, and as the gateway to West Africa, it, it, it doesn't look too good. 
when you hear of countries like Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, everybody mm -hmm. being on board, mm -hmm. you know, and we've invested a lot uh, in our ports, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, as a result, I don't see why we we lagging behind. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to lead, mm -hmm. and the good news is. Uh, People have been complaining about the high cost of uh, doing business. business. Uh, yeah, the transaction cost at the port itself, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. So this has come at the right time, and it's, it's a project that we think it, it stands to benefit not just those involved in international trade, mm -hmm. because we import a lot do, mm -hmm. and uh, the end result is mm -hmm. consumers, consumers, and we all buy. Yes. Uh, we all consumers one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So if it will lead to low prices of our goods, uh, it will lead to to access to most of the things that we desire. Then why not? Okay. It's, it's not limited to just business people, mm. but uh, traders and then consumers alike. Yeah. All right. I must say a big thanks to all of you this evening. The lady Olili Amors has Miss Valentina Minta, Chief Executive of the West Blue operators of the National Single Window. Thanks very much for your time this evening. May thanks to you also, Mr. Emmanuel Doni Kwame, uh, Secretary General, International Chamber of Commerce, Ghana, and also um, MD, World Trade Center, Accra. And then appreciation to you also, Mr. Joseph Agbaka, immediate past president, Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders, and a member of the National Trade Facility Committee. Thanks very much for your time this evening. And of all those who I saw, I saw calls coming in. I told you, calls, I will not take them. But messages. Thanks very much for being part of the show. Next week, we'll come around again with another topic. Till then, um, let's keep talking. Trade facilitation. Bye for now. <laughs>